Hello and welcome to our first webinar of the UPS and Startup Canada Women Exporters Program. I'm Crystal Falea, Managing Director at Startup Canada. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I'm on today is located in the unceded and traditional territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse ter uh, histories and cultures of all Indigenous people across the land. And I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are residing on today. Today's session is being recorded um, and the recording will be shared afterwards. Um, so there will be lots of notes and resources shared throughout today's session. Those will come through uh, in a nice summary for you after our first event today. We invite each of our attendees to introduce themselves and connect with each other in the Zoom chat. So feel free to share your name, your organization, and where you're joining from. And uh, just a little housekeeping piece, make sure to send your messages to everyone in the room, because um, otherwise Zoom defaults to sending messages only to the hosts and the panelists. So you'll just need to adjust that to everyone on your side. A little bit about Startup Canada. Uh, Startup Canada is a national nonprofit that is the gateway to Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are here to connect entrepreneurs with the support, community, and tools they need to build a successful business here in Canada. And since launching in 2012, we have grown to support more than 129,000 entrepreneurs annually from coast to coast through an ever-growing grassroots community network. In partnership with uh, UPS Canada, uh, we are very proud to present the Women Exporters Program, also referred to as WEP. You will see some acronyms um, through some of our materials, So WEP is uh, a nice little short form that we've come up with to use. This global initiative helps to bridge the gender gap in education and export participation by providing targeted assistance to women-owned small and medium-sized businesses. This program includes five webinars to support your exporting knowledge and business growth. The intention is to help you be more competitive, reach and sell to more customers and enter more markets through leveraging free trade. Uh, we've got a brief sort of snapshot of where we are today. Um, so over the next five months, uh, you'll be invited to participate in the following sessions ranging from how to prepare for export to how to leverage e-commerce and keep your customers happy. So lots of really great stuff and we've got lots of great um, subject matter experts lined up um, to contribute to these conversations. Today's webinar will cover the importance of exporting for small businesses and we'll focus on highlighting the benefits of expanding into new markets, including increased revenue, access to new customers, diversification of income streams, and additionally, the potential risks and challenges that businesses may face when entering new markets will also be explored. We're also bringing in um, successful exporters and, and women entrepreneurs who are already exporting to help add additional context and share their stories along the way as well. We have a, uh, in today's sort of lineup um, for our agenda, we have a presentation prepared um, by um, both UPS and Export Development Canada, who you'll learn more about today. Um, and then if you have any questions uh, throughout the session today, please make sure to leverage the Q&A box, um, which is, you can access it from the bottom function bar of your screen, and we'll do our best to try to answer the questions live. And if not, we'll try to see if we can address some of those questions in future sessions that we have coming up as well. So with, without further ado, I am very honored to introduce our speakers today. Um, Isabel, if you just want to skip to the next slide, we've got Anna Barrera, Director of Public Affairs from UPS Canada, which we'll hear from momentarily. Catherine Beach, National Lead Women in Trade from Export Development Canada. And Nita Tandon, feeder, um, founder and CEO of Delcini Stainless, um, who's got a great export journey and we're very grateful she was able to join us here today. So welcome speakers. And uh, with that, maybe Anna, I will turn the mic over to you to tell us a little bit more about UPS and the history of the Women Exporters Program. Great, thank you so much. Crystal, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I am Ana Barrera, and I am the Public Affairs Director at UPS Canada. Welcome to the first ever Women Exporters Program in Canada. To start off, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, showing the desire to take the next step in your business to bring your products and services to the world. We are so excited to take this first steps into the world of exporting with you. And we know that today is just the beginning for many of you, and we can't wait to see where you will go. Your ability to grow beyond borders isn't just a dream that you have to realize alone. 
the amount of support in Canada for growing businesses from organizations like Startup Canada and EDC is absolutely amazing. And of course, at UPS, we want to be your ally and support your growth. And we understand that our role goes beyond taking care of your supply chain needs. In 2018, UPS and the UPS Foundation pledged to do their part to empower women all over the world by, la by launching the Women Exporters Program. We have provided training and tools for women-owned businesses to thrive in, in trade. With partnerships all over the world, we have trained over 107,000 women and small businesses. The Women Exporters Program leverages the expertise and knowledge of our employees, partners, and export organizations, as well as harnessing UPS's global network to help women unlock new opportunities. We know when women-owned small businesses export, they tend to earn more, pay more, employ more people, and be more productive than firms that only operate domestically. Research shows that when Canadian women-owned businesses commit to exporting, they achieve superior financial performance. At UPS, we see firsthand the benefits of international trade for SMEs, accessing new customers, creating more jobs, earning higher revenues, building more resilient business models. These are just some of the reasons for SMEs to consider exporting into their strategy. We've also learned from government and organizations around the world that women are less likely to engage in global trade. This gap creates a huge opportunity for women to grow and scale their businesses. That's why we're so excited to launch WEP today with all of you and we can't wait to see where you will go first. Now, I'm very excited to start the presentations on why you should export. So today it's more practical than ever to sell goods and services across the globe. Most of the world's potential consumers are outside of Canada and many Canadian exporters continue to boost their bottom line and build their competitiveness by selling to world markets. Thanks to the internet, improved logistics channels, free trade agreement, e-commerce, and an array of available assistance through the Canadian government, exporting is more achievable than ever before. So why should you export? There are specific reasons, and shortly you will be hearing more about these from Catherine from EDC. But for now, let me share some of the benefits we have seen and heard from our customers. In fact, you are actually going to hear from one of our customers directly later. So Canadian women-led businesses can benefit from exporting. And here are six, and I'm going to share one more uh, that, are, that is specifically for women on why you should consider international markets. Market expansion. Exporting allows businesses to access larger and more diverse markets beyond Canada, which can lead to increased sales and growth opportunities. Global research, global reach. Exporting can provide women-led businesses with a global presence, enhancing their brand recognition and reputation on an international scale. Competitive advantage. Many businesses in foreign markets are actively seeking diversity and inclusion in their supply chains. Being a women-led business can be a unique selling point, giving you a competitive advantage in these markets. Networking and partnerships. Exporting often involves building relationships with international partners, distributors, customers. This can lead to valuable networking opportunities and strategic partnerships. Government support. The Canadian government offers various programs and initiatives that specifically support women entrepreneurs and their exporting needs providing financial assistance, mentorship, and access to resources. Job creation. Expanding into international markets can lead to job creation, benefiting not only the business owners, but also employees and the local economy. And finally, my favorite, which is the impact on women economic empowerment. Women-led businesses can export that export can contribute to the broader goal of women economic empowerment, helping to close the gender gaps in entrepreneurship and leadership by inspiring and empowering other women to pursue entrepreneurship and leadership roles. Now, I do want to note that exporting also comes with challenges from navigating trade barriers, understanding for foreign uh, re regulations, managing culture and market differences, dealing with logistics and securing financial and uh, financing and insurance. It is important that uh, it is important to note that women-led businesses may face unique challenges when exporting, such as breaking into male-dominated industries and dealing with the gender biases. 
However, with the right support, resources, and strategies, women-led businesses can overcome these challenges and thrive in international markets. Organizations and government agencies often offer specialized assistance and programs to help women-led businesses succeed in exporting endeavors, and that is our goal with the Women Exporting Program. Starting with this very first session, we want to start a dialogue. Our goal is not to just present slides to you, but to provide a place where you can ask questions, share the experiences from women-led businesses, provide that they, they can provide their advice, and along with startup and our partners, we want to help you succeed in exporting. So how does a small business contribute to Canada's exports? Why are they so important? As you can see from this graph, in, St in Statistics Canada's most recent key small business statistics, in 2021, Canada's exports of goods totaled over $570 billion in value, of which 20% was attributed to small business. That is the equivalent of $116 billion. As a total of establishments, over 52,000 Canadian businesses exported goods, and the vast majority of those were small business, a little over 90%. Imagine that 90% of small businesses are already exporting and they are doing it successfully. I also think it's important to see where these small businesses are exporting to. As I mentioned in the previous DATSCAN report, the main export destination was, no surprise, the United States. That was followed by China, with the United Kingdom in third place, Japan fourth, and Mexico in fifth. One of the key messages that you will hear from your experienced peers and experts during these sessions is the importance of research. Knowing your market, knowing your customers is key. Research, research, research is gonna be the most important thing you will need to do when you're starting your exporting journey. Let me share a very quick example with you. UPS has been conducting research on international consumers for years, and during our most recent study, we asked why shoppers bought from international retailers. Now, on the screen are the responses from the buyers of China, Mexico, and the UK. Overall, consumers look outside of their own market for products that they can source locally or from brand that is recognizable internationally. However, when you look at China, their top two reason is for the need for higher quality product and to ensure product authenticity. Now, we all know what is the one thing that Canadians do and are known well around the world? It is quality and authenticity. Those are the two on top of the list. So knowing your target market and what local shoppers expect is a good start. And we will be sharing a lot more of this as the pro program progresses. Now, before I turn it over to Catherine, I have one more slide to share with you. And as a trade nerd, it is my absolute favorite, which is the importance of free trade agreements. I noted at the beginning that learning to navigate trade barriers and understand foreign regulations is key. But if your government has done most of the work for you, it is even better. And our Canadian government has done a pretty good job of making it easier for Canadian businesses to export around the world thanks to their free trade agreements. There are currently 15 FTAs in force that help reduce barriers of entry and other red tape, while also reducing the cost with lower or eliminated tariffs. One great example is the Canada-US-Mexico Agreement, or CUSMA, where the trade de minimis is set at $800 US dollars for your shipment entering to the US. That provides you, as a Canadian businesses, with a great advantage and levels the playing field against local competitors. Two other great examples are the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement with the EU, where 98% of duties have already been eliminated, or the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, where 95% of the duties have been eliminated. Understanding these trade agreements and using them to your advantage when building your export strategy is crucial. So we will dedicate a lot more on this topic in the future. But for now, it is my absolute pleasure to hand it over to Catherine Beach, the National Lead for Inclusive Trade, Women in Trade from EDC. The floor is yours, Catherine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Anna. So I'm just going to share my screen and then I, we will get going. Okay, so hopefully that worked. <laughs> 
Um, so just to start off, I just want to honestly say this is so exciting to be part of today's webinar. So honestly, a real sincere congratulations to, to Crystal and Anna at UPS and Startup for creating this program. Um, and like Anna mentioned, a huge congrats to all of you for showing up, for recognizing that you're an exporter or wanting to take the next step to make it part of your deliberate strategy. And I'm so excited to check out all the interesting entrepreneurs in the chat. I was a little bit distracted, so definitely a good question around how can we save it so we can check it out later. So as mentioned, I'm Catherine and I lead the Women in Trade Strategy at Export Development Canada, so EDC. Je vais présenter en anglais, mais je suis content de prendre des questions en français aussi. I'm speaking with you today from Ottawa, in my home office, on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people, who we thank for sharing this land with. So for, you, for those of you who don't know about EDC, Export Development Canada, we're Canada's export credit agency. And our job is to help Canadian companies do business successfully in international markets. So we use our deep knowledge of international trade and global buyers to enable companies to take on and manage significant levels of risk. And I'll talk a little bit more about concretely what that means shortly, okay? So I wanted to start off um, dispelling some of the myths about exporting. So like I said, really awesome that you all recognize that you wanted to be seen as exporters or take that deliberate step. But in reality, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially women or other entrepreneurs who identify from equity deserving groups, don't think they're exporters. They think it's only for big companies that are shipping large boxes and boxes of containers. And in fact, this is just not true, right? So as Anna mentioned, we now see more and more companies that are born globally with e-commerce or tech-enabled businesses. They set up an e-commerce website and, and they're selling outside of Canada from the get-go. Um, we also know that there's more demand internationally. So this is a really important part of your business strategy. So we always encourage women entrepreneurs to recognize that they're exporters because this is what's going to give you access to different programs um, like working with EDC or UPS or startup. So like Anna talked about, we obviously at Export Development Canada believe very much in exporting as a strategy to growth. There's a lot of reasons um, and a couple ones that I always like to kind of level set is just around the addressable market. So Canada only represents 2% of our global economy. So if you think about what that could mean for your business stepping outside of Canada, it's quite significant. And the US, which is where most companies go first, not all, but most, represents 10 times the population of Canada and a much more concentrated population. So I'm sure Anna could talk all about the benefits of having a more concentrated um, population from a shipping perspective. So there's been a lot of studies done on why exporters do better or the benefits. And some of the key stats that have all, always been shown are really the following. So exporters make more money. So like I said, if you have a larger market, if you're selling to more individuals, of course, you're going to be getting more sales. They also grow faster. So if you look at the trajectory of growth, exporters are the curve is much higher. They're also more productive and more competitive. So this one research showed that they were 30% more competitive. And the reason why is that if you think about it, you're selling into larger markets, you're creating economies of scale. This really helps reduce inefficiencies and reduce costs but you're also exposed to new ideas, technology, and you're looking at being more innovative. And all of this goes back to your bottom line. Something we definitely saw with COVID um, was that, you know, being an exporter and diversifying your markets, this helps weather economics ups and downs. And the reason why is because you're not putting your eggs in all one basket, right? So if consumer trends shift, if something happens, well, you're able to pivot more quickly than if you were only concentrated on one region or one market. Your risk is spread across. Um, other stats that we've seen are exporters that are more connected, they stay in business longer, and they're more innovative. Okay, so a question we get often asked, and maybe you're even asking yourself, or, okay, but when am I ready? <laughs> okay. And what are kind of some key success factors? So the answer, maybe I'm going to like, um, it really depends. So it really depends on what your business model is, kind of what your delivery model is, the sector. Like I said, a lot of companies are just born globally from the beginning. So there's a couple of things you need to take in consideration regardless though. One is, do you have an export plan? Do you have access to sufficient working capital? Do you have sufficient capacity, both from a human perspective, but also an operational perspective, as well as do you have the right partnerships and do you have the right networks? So things like really looking to scale globally really requires thinking about these things before you think to enter large um, corporate supply chains. 
So when we talk about an export plan, really your company needs to have a really solid business plan for domestic growth. And then you can kind of evolve that and incorporate export elements. So that would be everywhere from financing, marketing, logistics, competition, and more. But really the number one consideration when you're thinking about developing that export plan is what market are you going to target first? And where do you believe you're going to have the best chance to succeed? And making sure that you're not thinking about, you're thinking about markets and not just countries. So if you think about the U.S., that can be divided into multiple regions, multiple markets. Like mentioned, sufficient capital is really important. So often sometimes folks only think about the working capital financing aspects, but human and operational is almost as if not as just as important. Um, because as you start scaling, you really need to make sure that you have that um, sufficient capacity to support that. And making sure you have the right partners at the table. So that's like organizations like EDC and, and UPS and startup and other players in the ecosystem. But it's also thinking about are you connected with the local agents and the local reps? Some of the other external factors that might kind of signal that it's time to start thinking about exporting is, is looking at kind of the data and trends in terms of consumer behavior. So analyze your own website traffic. Um, look at your social media demographics. Where are sales coming from? Are you getting inquiries from certain regions? Was it a one-off or is something more there? Should you dig into that? Another good example is you might already be actually selling into an international supply chain. So if you're selling to someone in Canada and they are then exporting your product, well, you're an indirect exporter and there may actually be demand for your product if you went directly. The other um, strategy, and I think Nita used this in some of her expansions, um, was following your buyers. So if you're selling to a company within Canada, well, are they also international? And can you follow them to that global market? And can you help facilitate those introductions? So there's been a couple of studies then to show really what does success, what does it take to be successful? And these are just kind of some tips. You'll have this list, and I've also put the link to kind of the detailed version, but a couple of things I want to highlight. So the first one is really setting your business up for success. So something like incorporating your business, this is going to really protect you um, from a risk perspective, but it also opens you up to more resources. There's a lot of programs and grants that you're not eligible for unless you are incorporated. Um, the other couple elements I would just kind of highlight, Anna touched a little bit upon this, and I think you're going to get into this a little bit further in this program, is really understanding the risks and coming up with a plan to mitigate them because they may happen. So if you're getting ahead of that and you're thinking about, okay, the risk of non-payment, how could I mitigate that? So going through kind of that process as you develop your plan is really important. And lastly, I really like this stat because it's, it's, it's higher for women. So businesses that are more likely to have a global competitive advantage when leadership has a global mindset. So when we look at what it takes to be a successful exporter, being born with that mindset from your, the big, beginning of your business of thinking globally really can set, yourself, set you up for success. Okay, so I wanted to just really briefly speak about how EDC supports companies along their journey. I'll go through this really quickly, but my next slide, you have our website as well as my contact information. So feel free to reach out directly to me. So at the beginning, maybe kind of aware of several of you are at on your export journey, you're really looking for information you're planning, you're taking it all in. So EDC has a wealth of knowledge on our website. Definitely recommend you to go check that out. We have lots of webinars. Our newsletter um, is a great resource as well. Once you start growing outside of Canada, the first financial product that we often speak to folks about is credit insurance. So credit insurance protects your profits and balance sheets by insuring against the risk of non-payment. It also allows you to be more competitive because you can get comfortable offering better payment terms to your customers. And lastly, you're working with a bank, they're actually more likely to assign um, value to foreign accounts receivables that are insured. So it's actually a great way to get access to more capital through your bank. As companies really start to grow and scale and they take on more and more contracts internationally, what they need is access to additional working capital to really make sure that they're able to pivot quickly, invest in their business and respond to new opportunities. So how EDC works from a financing perspective is we work directly with financial institutions, so your bank or your credit union, and we offer different guarantee programs so that your financial institution's risk is reduced and they're more likely to extend more lending value to you. So they get comfortable taking on that risk. And lastly, connections. So like Anna mentioned, there's so many organizations within Canada that offer support to exporters. And sometimes we speak to folks and we're not the right organization for them for where they're at on their journey. So we definitely play that role to facilitate introductions to other players in the ecosystem. 
Okay. So that's it for me. That's my contact information. I will also put it, my LinkedIn in the chat if someone, Crystal, hadn't already put it in, which you probably did. Um, and I'm so excited to pass it to Nita. I'm not sure if I'm doing that now, but if I am, then that's great. If not, Crystal, back to you. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Catherine. And we are about to jump in with Nita, but I do want to double click on something you said just to reinforce that like exporting isn't always about, you know, freight ships and like big distribution deals and the notions and all that kind of stuff. You can start exporting at a smaller scale close to some neighbors that we are in proximity that I'm hoping we can um, uncover. So it's a big reason of why we are hosting this series is to help, you know, encourage other women owned businesses to consider exporting and how they can start taking steps towards that. So thank you so much for sort of tapping on that and, and sharing your expertise. EDC has been a great um, partner of ours for many, many years. Lots of great resources, so I will reinforce that. We will be sharing some resources, um, as I mentioned um, before, at the end of our session today and also in our recaps, um, but we've got um, plenty of good um, content from EDC. Um, so thank you again, Catherine. Very much appreciated. Um, without further ado, um, I would love to introduce um, our next speaker um, who's going to join me for a little Q&A. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Delcini Stainless, Anita Tandon. Delcini Stainless was launched in 2015 and is an award-winning brand of durable, chemical-free, eco-friendly housewares. Um, I know you can also buy them at the Bay now. Very cool. Lots of exciting news on um, that you've had in the last couple of years, Anita. Um, thanks so much for joining us today and maybe where we can start off just to share a little bit with um, all of our attendees today is um, a little bit about how your company started exporting like how did you start building that plan at a high level and then which markets are you currently exporting in that might kind of help set some context for our, our attendees um, for sure. So uh, thank you very much for even having me today. And I'm, I absolutely love that you're doing this session specifically for women because um, I too was one of those um, businesses that started and thought, oh, I'm not ready for export. And um, I never really thought I was exporting because I wasn't doing the large scale, you know, large containers off to another market. But essentially I started exporting right away. So let me just give you a little bit of background. I launched Dalcini Stainless in 2015, and I launched it because we are stainless steel food containers, and I was looking for a product for myself. I had done a lot of research on the amount of chemicals that are on food containers, and so, you know, I, I was trying to go against plastic, which was the major player in Canada. But when you look down to the states, there were states that were already removing plastic, that already had legislation in place uh, about BPA. I mean, we had BPA um, legislation, but it was only to not have it on baby bottles. With food containers, to this day, we still have BPA on our on our food containers. And what Canada did was um, allowed a lot of uh, products that came in that were BPA free, but essentially were the same issue. So I really thought if I need to start educating people in Canada, that costs money. And it's going to take a while before I get that sale. I would rather go directly to a market that already understands um, the issue that I'm trying to solve. And for me, that was California. California was where a lot of the research um, had been done. Also, Calgary was a lot of the research. So I looked at the research centers and started there. So in Canada, um, out west became uh, one of my markets. And then moving down into the US, California became one of my markets. And um, California almost found out about me before I ever even did any marketing. And so that was the really fun part too, was I really looked at where is my traffic coming from? So everything that Catherine has been taught, you know, said in her presentation is essentially what I did without really following a plan. I just looked at the data and where is it coming from? And like most women owned businesses, um, there's not a whole lot of money. And so you really need to look at what is the, the least expensive way to get to the market where you want to go um, and start bringing in the dollars. Uh, so, so essentially that's where I started. I started um, exporting right away. And today we are exporting throughout the U S um, we have exported to New Zealand. We tried uh, the UK didn't quite succeed there. So we pulled back and uh, we have plans for two new countries that we're evaluating right now. 
That's awesome. And it's great to see that you kind of had export right from the get go in mind as you're sort of building your business at the same time. And I think focusing in on those opportunities where you're you're seeing the research, you're seeing activity in those areas, and then sort of mapping that geographically and helping to sort of hone in on, you know, those markets, I think is um, a really awesome sort of um, tip, even for other folks, um, depending on on their industries to be mindful of too, where a up ball. Um, what would you say would be, you know, how would you summarize the key advantages um, for your business of entering some of these markets um, and, and, and the sort of advantages between, you know, staying local and staying close to home versus sort of like opening yourself up to new opportunities um, sort of across the border and beyond? Well, I mean, if, it, if the pandemic taught me anything, it was to be uh, really quick to pivot and, um, you know, having my foot in two countries really helped because essentially when Canada was shut down and there were so many rules about what you could do and what you couldn't do, um, you know, we started seeing essentially all of the retail stores in Canada closed. And so uh, my, my retail business dropped by 90% literally overnight. And I had to do something really quickly. Well, already having a foot in the US, the US bounced back a lot quicker than we did. And, um, and, and so I just continued there. So I would say the, the, the idea to diversify was huge. Um, but also you start to see little, uh, little tweaks. I mean, sustainability, the conversation happened in certain regions in the U.S., you know, before it happened here. And that would be the same, like in Canada, you'd see the West Coast was, was talking about sustainability quicker than Ontario was. That's the same with the U.S., but we're just looking at 10 times the population. So diversifying absolutely um, is, is key. It's such a great tip. Um, so then like moving over more into some of the common challenges and barriers that you faced, um, both um, as a, 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 a female identifying entrepreneur, exporting a, your products, and also as a person of color. Um, I'm sure you can help sh share some challenges that you faced in your journey and, and any tips that you have on how to kind of keep your head up and, and kind of push through that Time. Yeah, <laughs> that can so, be challenging. Yeah, absolutely challenging because the, the truth is, I, I actually, so I grew up in Canada. I was born in India. I grew up in Canada and I really didn't grow up with racism per se. And so um, I really assumed that starting a business would be the exact same, right? Just uh, different people, different colors, everyone kind of get along. And what I soon realized is that the playing field isn't equal. And a lot of it is unconscious bias. It's there's this this bias of what has always been, and people just get into patterns and don't realize that um, you know there's another viewpoint to everything. And so uh, some of the areas that I ended up struggling with was uh, one, obviously financing. Um, we hear all the time that women don't have access to capital, and I was I, I'm in that bucket. Well, was in that bucket thanks to EDC. That's changed. <laughs> But, you know, the issue really becomes um, how do you convince people that are in business it generally tends to be male dominated that your business is is worthy and um, how do you rise above that? I think you just keep going and you, you keep pivoting and going to people that are going to listen to you now. You know, I've shared this a few times, but one of the things happened during the pandemic was the, the borders between Canada and the US were never closed for business. It was always closed for, um, for personal travel. And so I live very close to the US border. And, um, you know, I think 2020 um, was the first time that I said, okay, I really need to pick up sales and I need to pick them up quickly. And so I approached Good Morning America. So Good Morning America does, you know, they, they talk about different products and, I was the first um, Canadian-based company to be aired on Good Morning America. Now, Canadian-based being that my footprint is exclusively in Canada because a lot of other countries have been there, but they've got a footprint in the U.S. already. They've got sales reps there. They've got an office in the States. But this was Canadian company going down. One of the things I had to, to uh, work out was how do I deal with uh, returns? And so I found a solution for that. Um, I had to go across the border to sign, uh, uh, you know, a, a deal essentially. 
And when I crossed the border, they didn't believe that I was a business. Then I had called ahead of time to the border and I'd spoken and said exactly what it was that I was going to do. And they said, yes, uh, the border is open to you. But when I got there, it was a different story. Um, it was they they thought I was either going to pick up shopping across the border or was I um, like a Tupperware salesperson uh, meeting up with friends? I mean, it was very condescending uh, and there's nothing that you can do when you get to the border and someone tells you you're not a business. I even tried to reach for, for documentation to show them they wanted nothing to do with it. And so how did I manage that? Wow. I did come home. And I decided I had a choice of either, you know, my, my husband looked at me, said, do you really want to go back? He said, um, you know, the, the border, uh, they have a lot of power. And so do you really want to go back? And so my thought is, if I don't, then I continue with um, the, 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 this playing field that's not equal. And if I come back, think about it, try to change it, how long is that going to take me? Um, but I thought if I did nothing, that wasn't an option. So I did call a border again. I told them exactly what happened and they corrected it. And so the next time I went through, doors were open and they said, we're, you know, they apologized. Um, I was able to go through no problem. The issue that I had the next time was on the Canadian side. And you know, it was very difficult to have anyone to respond there. And so, you know, pointing the finger and saying, oh, but the US has issues. No, Canada has issues too. There's definitely a gender bias and um, people of color, any layer, if you have, if you're wearing a hijab, if you have a turban, if you're male, you know, th there's anything that is different than what is currently seen as business, there's gonna be um, an unconscious bias. And, you know, how do you get around it? You you speak louder because people don't make changes unless they hear what the obstacles are. So. Um, I would say if you are facing obstacles, find an outlet to bring your story to the surface, because as soon as people found out that there was an issue, they've done things to correct it. So that would be my, my <laughs> suggestion there. And that's a great summary of experience. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think, you know, there's so many different things that you have to be mindful of in, in just kind of like the business mind frame that you're in when you're dealing with export, then layer a pandemic on top of things, all the health regulations, all of that. And then to have and sort of be faced with that resistance, you know, you're like, I'm just trying to get through. I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta like keep things going because, you know, things are, are not so um, sunshine and roses. Um, so um, thank you for, for sharing that experience with us, Nita. Um, I do have, there are a bunch of questions in the chat. I'm going to try to get through as many as we can, but um, Nita, one, one of the questions um, specifically is around, how did you find the research? Um, where did you start to find the research and then know how to target California when you were first getting started? I, I didn't. Uh, so I didn't really start with research. I started with, well, I guess I did. You know, when I was looking at how I started my product, I knew that a lot of the research about BPA was done in California. And so that was one area that I always said, if I'm going to um, be successful, my, my vision of success was that I was going to make it in California because they completely understand my story of sustainability and also the chemicals. Um, and as soon as I said that, it was almost as if I said it out loud and people started contacting me. So it was a weird thing. I, it's, you know, when they say you, you put it out in the universe, I co totally believe that because um, they started contacting me and uh, the questions that they had about my products, I could answer very quickly. And so it just became a couple of retailers contacted. Um, I was able to sell through e-commerce. Um, as long as you have a barcode, um, as long as you know what HS code, really e-commerce, it's quite easy. And especially with UPS, because um, the way the system, you know, you're when you're putting printing out a label, whether it's for Canada or the US, the process is the same. And UPS kind of walks you through the information that you need. Uh, two pointers I would give there is make sure that you are completely honest with everything. So it's like, what's the value of the goods? Um, what category is it? All of that. Because as soon as you start getting flagged, you're going to get flagged every time and there's going to be issues. So I was very honest right from the get go. And I can say eight years in, um, I've only had uh, the border, well, you know, being contacted once and they knew it was an error because I always say that my products are from India and this one time it said 
uh, I don't know if it said Canada or it said Nigeria, or like it was completely different. And they said, okay, we realized this was just a typo. And then it just went on, but it's because everything to this date was accurate. And so um, I would say, be very, very accurate, know your information, but then just, if you just even sell one thing across the border, you're exporting. And um, to start with this knowledge of, I can do this. Um, if you are selling in Canada, there is no reason why you can't be selling in the US. And then it's really to say, if um, you're selling in Canada and you're doing well, I would say, look in Canada, what, uh, because Canada is the same, it, that it's not the same market across Canada. And then to really say in Canada, who is my niche? What province am I doing particularly well? And find one that's similar to that in the US. And I would also say for um, a lot of people, so immigrants, I would say, um, if you've come here recently, the country that you left, you know that country so well. So I would say even suggest start exporting there. It, like use whatever knowledge you have. Um, I went to school in France for a little while. So I, I knew France well. So that look, to me looked like an option. Um, they are very sustainable. They have a lot of rules about chemicals. And so that was an area that I, uh, you know, a country that I um, tried and I can't tell you that I had to pivot because not every market is the same. So I thought that was the avenue I was going to go um, and, and then had to pull out. But that's a whole other question. Well, and it's and it's interesting. It kind of leads into another question that came in through the Q&A here is um, what do you do when a market is not giving you the results you expected and how do you pivot? Like what are some sort of like strategies to do that effectively and in a, a, a way that's not going to be too time consuming? Well, so a lot of um, I would say the educational way and the training way is to make sure you do a lot of research and you put money into it and all that sort of stuff. The practicality for me was I didn't have the money and the resources to put into all this research about every country. And so a lot of it is um, trial and error. And um, I didn't put a lot of money into it and I would just see if it would gain traction. But I always had sort of a money amount or how many orders I would get through before I had issues. Um, and so for me, for an example, like I uh, contacted France. Well, first of all, France had contacted me. It was um, Gathley Lafayette in Paris uh, was looking at my housewares. And so I wanted to uh, export and I thought, what a perfect opportunity. But what I soon realized is when I launched the company, I launched to uh, replace kids lunch containers. And that was really the niche that I was uh, going after. What I soon realized is in, in France, um, kids don't bring their lunch to school. In France, the school provides lunch and offices provide lunch for their employees. And so food storage contain or um, lunch containers didn't really make sense. And so when I pivoted, I changed it and I became um, food storage containers. And suddenly my market opened up over there. And so then there was a lot of that. Where I had difficulty was because if I really wanted to go full out food storage, um, does require some marketing and some effort. And so I just thought, yes, I will go there, just not today, not right now. Um, and when I am ready, it will be very quick because I have knowledge about their market now. Um, so I just right now go to markets that I know uh, I don't need to make a lot of changes to. That's brilliant. And and did you feel like, is that something where you need to shift your whole brand or is it more in like being creative with the positioning of the utility of the product? And I think yeah. you can get creative with, you know, marketing copy and things of that nature versus having to build a whole that new brand for the same products that you want to use in, in different contexts. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, uh, so when during the pandemic, um, I got picked up by Indigo. So my product went into um, 100 stores across Canada. And it was very exciting because, you know, when I thought I was losing my business, I suddenly was like, boom, okay, now you got to get into all these stores. But then when the, the, the pandemic sort of went ongoing, and a lot of stores started closing and all of that, then at one point, um, Indigo said, you know, kids aren't taking their lunch to school. So that was the same sort of conversation as France. And I said, oh, no, but um, take a look at the market, the market for food storage, people are now having having to you know keep their food for longer at home and so all I did was change it um, slightly and suddenly we were back in business again and so I say be creative um, look at the wording that you use for your product and in your pitch deck 
make sure it makes sense to the person who is receiving it. Not necessarily like sometimes we get in our head and we know that this is a great idea, but you also have to look at it from their perspective. And if they're not looking for lunch containers right now, but food storage containers, and it's the same product, you know, it, it, it just needs yeah. creativity and thinking. Multifunctional usage for sure. If you can kind of leverage that um, yeah. to the best of your ability, depending on your product, why not? Right. Um, another question that came up in the chat earlier, and and Catherine, I know you answered this directly, but I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up to Nita as well because I think you can shed some perspective um, on this question specifically. But when we're talking about exporting, and in this example, they're asking about a clothing brand more specifically. But um, is there like do we mean wholesaling to retailers, shipping directly to customers? You know, define that sort of like retail trade and exporting, um, maybe you can kind of share some insights from your perspective as well. I say do it all because the more data you get is, is better to then grow from that. So there are a lot of areas where you can, uh, with minimal effort, sell your products to retailers in the States. And one of those is FAIR. So FAIR, um, I would highly encourage anyone who has a brand, um, a product-based brand, um, just list your product up there and, you know, just see the orders come in. Um, and then you will see what what part they're in, uh, what type of stores are are, um, are are receptive to your product, but also send stuff through your website. So e-commerce is also really strong. So um, direct to consumer. And again, you will start to get data and you'll start to say, oh, look at that. I've got 80% that's e-commerce and 20% is here or you know, the other way around, or, you know, getting a lot of questions, but early days, all you're doing is really collecting as much data. So with that data that you can then expand, because there's no way when it comes time to expansion that you can do everything all at once. Um, you're going to have to pick an area and, and grow with it. Totally. Uh, and one other question that came in through the chat here is, must you be the creator of the product to export, or can you just be a reseller? And, and Catherine, I'm going to open that question up to you as well, perhaps. Well, I think Nita's product's a great example of this. So I'm going to pass back to yeah. her to have the. Yeah. Um, so my products are manufactured in India, but I do uh, help design them and all of that. So they are my product that I'm selling. Um, you know, but a lot of times the trade agreements, it's the product has to be made in Canada to then go in, into the U.S. But my products, as long as you put the the area, of the the country of origin. Again, it's being really, really upfront about your product. Um, I was able to describe the product uh, very specifically. And so from my understanding is that even if you are a reseller, as long as you write the country of origin, um, you know, you, you may not be part of the same trade agreement, but there's still a lot of benefit. And for me, I mean, to me to import the products into Canada, I pay 6%. Well, the US it's 2%. And so, you know, there's a significant difference even just um, if I expanded in the States um, and have the product go directly from India to the US uh, versus having it come through Canada. So you, you start to learn like the logistics of what's the easiest way to get the product from point A to point B. Um, but yeah, I, I think you can, but I think Catherine can probably answer better of, of uh, being a reseller. Yeah, I was trying to find, we have a great article on this. Sometimes there's rules and maybe Anna can even speak to this more from a policy perspective from the fair trade agreements, but sometimes there's rules of percentage of Canadian goods and things like branding and marketing that actually counts. So it's a little bit of a gray area, but I see Anna nodding. So maybe she wants to add a little bit there. Awesome. No, no I, I, that's exactly right, Catherine. I, I think each agreement is, is very unique and special in how they consider a rule of origin or where the, the country of origin the product is. So definitely recommend doing some research on depending on where you're going and how it bases. And I know that UPS has some great resources as well. So we're happy to help you if you have any questions about how to export your product and which is the best route for that. That's that's our expertise. Right. Awesome. Um, so, Nina, just on the sort of on the financial side of things, I'm going to shift over uh, another question that's come through is how do you manage the foreign exchange currency fluctuations? Um, and do you do you sort of base your pricing on some of that conversion? And, and in this context, the, the person is asking specifically about U.S., um, but I'm very open to uh, other markets as well. I don't even know how to answer that one because I. Um... 
I don't know that I did it right the first time. So I'll tell you what my mistake was first. <laughs> I had a different price for the US and then for Canada. And so, for example, if it was $20 in Canada, I would have $20 US. And so I tried that for a little while and it was great because I was making 30% more. And, um, but then I ended up realizing that this isn't gonna help me at all because especially when I worked for, uh, did that, pro that show on Good Morning America, they wanted to make sure that whatever they were selling it at was going to be equivalent to what I was selling it at in Canada. And so I realized that I needed to make some changes. But now that my product I, sh I sell on Shopify, e-commerce, the prices are the, the same and it shows in the currency of the country that they're, that they, with the geo-targeting, they see it in their mm -hmm. currency. And so essentially um, everything pays through to me in Canadian dollars, but I'm not really doing any of the conversion stuff. I'm still getting it in Canadian dollars. Now for the US, um, again, with FAIR, there's so many solutions and I found one with WISE. That's, um, it's an, uh, I guess it's considered a, a bank for e-commerce businesses around the world. And you have access to so many different currencies. So now the US, whenever I work with them, they pay into my US bank account and I can decide whenever it's the best time to switch it over to Canadian funds and you manage that. Um, I, I would highly recommend uh, WISE. It's worked very, very well for me. That's great. So we are coming close to time. So I maybe only have time for one or two questions. Again, uh, if we don't get to everyone's question in the chat today, we'll do our best to answer them even in future sessions as well. Um, and But also feel free to connect with all of our speakers today um, on LinkedIn. Um, again, we shared them earlier in the chat and uh, happy to answer questions as we move forward as well. But Nita, one thing we haven't touched on is relationship building with international markets. Um, maybe you can share some tips on effective networking and sort of building international business relationships um, that can help aid in that core process? Well, I think networking is good um, no matter what country you do it in. I, I think the important thing about networking is making sure that before you go to an event, know what's the question you want to have answered or what is it the that you're looking for? Because otherwise it just becomes a good chat session and everyone just kind of socializes and it's great. And you have a business, I have a business, great, whatever. But it's, it's really got to be more than that. It's got to be um, so laser focused on why are you meeting in the first place? And as an entrepreneur, your time is so limited that you have to make sure that your, that your time um, is, is moving your business forward. Uh, and so for networking, the ones that I have done um, successfully now, again, I'm going to give you my experience and not <laughs> which is the right and wrong way to do it. But um, I did find at general uh, networking sessions that were men and women, I just felt like I never really engaged as much um, and that I was always kind of left on the periphery and that you were always seen sort of as the niche market or that um you know, that I was an ethnic market trying to sell to other Indian people or that I was, um, you know, you know, in uh, multi-level marketing, like it just, you always got put into a box. I found working with women organizations. And so Coralist for me was great. Um, and that when I had a specific question, I went to the community and said, can someone help me with this? And they don't necessarily have to be in the U S but it is an international, um, organization that you can be in touch with someone in the US. Uh, the other one too is Revolution Her. Um, I found they were very helpful as well. Um, uh, Startup Canada, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I would say wherever there is women gathering, women business owners, I think just know who it is that you would like to, to um, talk to. And if they're not there, there's probably someone in the room that can put you in touch with that person. Love that. And and we do have um, a dedicated programming to support women entrepreneurs at Startup Canada through our Startup Women program. Um, we also have an exporting specific program. This is a program where we're trying to merge the worlds together and sort of help to bridge that gap. Um, so lots of uh, women support organizations that we have connections into. So for all of the attendees who might be looking for different organizations that they can contact, uh, um, just reach out to us and we will help point you in the right direction and connect you with some of these really, really amazing organizations. Um, that are doing really great work across Canada to support women entrepreneurs. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap things up here because we're at time. I know, Nita, we could be chatting all day and I 
feel like there are like 10 other questions um, I could ask you, but um, we might have to bring you back um, for a later uh, session uh, down the line. But I know there were so many resources shared in the chat. We have um, um, built out a bit of a list here as well. So you'll get access to all of these links. Some of them um, go into more detail on Canada's free trade agreements. Um, there are some really great resources that were shared um, from all of our speakers today that we've also tried to collect in here as well. So make sure between now and our next session um, to check out some of these great resources just as a bit of a next step. So you'll get this um, along with the, the link to the recording. If you want to listen back to anything, you'll be able to do that. As part of that, we will be issuing um, a complete survey where we do want to hear from you. So stay tuned for the follow-up email to come. And then our next webinar we are prepping for um, will be on October 17th and how to prepare for export. So again, we're kind of bringing you on a uh, on an export journey, if you will. So starting with our basics and high level understanding of exporting and what it can do for your business today, and then trying to dig in a little deeper. So we will do more sessions on e-commerce specifically, um, uh, customer relations and customer service more specifically as well in a digital um, sort of like global context. Um, so a lot of really great um, material to to come so please stay tuned you should have received um, invites to join all of the sessions that we have lined up between now and february uh, a couple of follow-up items that we do have um, is we do have a special um, a promo code for Startup Canada from our beloved friends at UPS Canada. Um, so we'll share a link to access that. Uh, I also invite you to, um, to tap into our additional sort of advisory support that we have through our sort of global program um, that can help you sort of in your journey between now, today, and in and, and our next session together. Um, this platform um, allows you to book 30 minute meetings with subject matter experts from a range of different backgrounds. So if you've got specific questions you want to ask about your business, we've got plenty of, of, of mentors online that you can access. So, and it's all free. So we'll share some of those links in the chat as well. Um, and um, if you have any questions, I know there are, there are some questions in the chat about questions. Um, please do reach out to us and let us know um, if you've missed a link or if you missed a name of something, we're happy to help sort of wayfind back to a lot of the great information that was shared today. Um, so I do want to give a big, big, big thank you to UPS uh, Canada and the Women Exporters Program. And in general, we are very proud to be part of bringing this program here to Canada. Um, as um, uh, Anna had mentioned previously, this um, program has taken place in other markets internationally. And so we're excited to be able to deliver on this program here with you all today. And big shout out to Export Development Canada. They have been a huge partner of ours, like I mentioned previously for a number of years. Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and to share some insights um, from your perspective. We know Women in Trade is a huge focus for EDC, um, and so you've been a great partner um, in all your support in helping us prepare for today's event. And Nita, again, thank you so much for joining us and for bringing your insights and your experience and sharing with everyone here today. Honestly, I think a, the entrepreneur perspective is more important than ever um, when we're trying to explain some of these complex topics like exporting and like what it is and what it means and all the wonderful things that are um, sort of that need to be kept in mind when exporting, but you've done a, a terrific job. You've got a great brand um, and we are excited to watch your business continue to grow as well. So thank you for taking the time today to to be with us. Um, yes, without further ado, I do want to thank all the attendees for taking time um, today. Again, we will have another session on October 17th. If you haven't registered, um, we'll send that link again and we'll see you all next month. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate your time. <laughs>